Hello there, it's Dylan. And today I want to talk to you about things that I think every game programmer should know. So I've been programming games for about between five and 10 years, depending on how you count it. Uh, there's kind of before five years ago, I was using engines like Unity and Godot and Unreal, Unreal 3 actually. And then there's after five years ago where I started using uh, C and now I'm using Odin and Raylib. Now, I'm not going to get into the reasons why I changed in this video. It's not really important. The stuff that I'm going to talk about applies to both camps. All right, so first of all, I think one of the most important things that a lot of engines have to limited degrees at the moment um, is hot reloading. So, for example, you know, you're, let's say, making a 2D platformer and you're trying to figure out the character's jump height and, like, what the gravity should feel like, uh, how far they should be able to move horizontally or vertically. What you really don't want to be doing in that situation is putting in the numbers, you know, changing the numbers in the inspector if you're in an engine or right, to, you know, changing the variable in code and then recompiling the game and then opening it again and then jumping and then like, okay, that doesn't feel right. And then, you know, going back and forth. Nowadays, that's not a huge problem in, uh, I think in Unity, you can, you can set this up pretty easily. You can change while the game's running. I don't know that much about other engines right now. I think you can do it in Godot as well. Um, but, you know, if you're building your own engine, you want to build this. And it's actually not that hard to build. If you want to learn how to do that, uh, you can check out Handmade Hero. Or uh, I believe Carl Zielinski recently made a video, well, semi-recently, about how to do it with Odin and Raylib. So check those out. It's just really useful, being able to tweak your gameplay code while the game's running. Super useful. Second thing you need to know. Now, with engines, this is trivial. Without engines, you're going to have to learn a little bit. But drawing stuff on the screen, drawing shapes. It can be anything, even rectangles, right? As soon as you've got some rectangles, you can move them around. You can start prototyping a game. Now, whether that's using a rendering library like Raylib, which is what I'm using currently, or building your own Vulkan pipeline, which I've also done, uh, it doesn't really matter. As long as you can draw stuff, you know, you've got that figured out, you need to know how to do that. I mean, unless you're making a text adventure, which are still a thing in this day and age. So... That's a bit different, but yeah, third thing, third, third thing, uh, linear algebra now, or at least a little bit about vectors. Now, why do you want to know about linear algebra? Well, everything that you do in a game is like moving stuff around usually in 2d space or 3d space, you know? So when you want something to move from point A to point B, how do you do that? Let's say you've got a circle. It's in the middle of the screen. doesn't matter how it got there. Usually you'd have an X and a Y coordinate for the circle. I mean, that's how things usually get set up. And when you add to the X or add to the Y, it'll move, you know, to the, to the right or down or up, depending on which direction your up is. And um, this is all vector math. So you need to know that. Now, how? How should you learn the math that you need? This is something that I struggled with quite a bit. I bought a bunch of textbooks. They're actually sitting behind me over there. And I would start one of them and then just not do them. I don't know how people work through textbooks if they're not at school, it's like crazy, crazy hard discipline, or maybe you just like textbooks, I don't know. For me, I like to do something I call just-in-time learning. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but what I wanna say is if you front load your game dev progress with a bunch of textbooks, like you have to finish these textbooks before you can start making games, you're never gonna make the games, unless you're really into textbooks, like I said, but I think most of us aren't like that. So you're just setting yourself up for failure by doing that. And uh, something else I want to say, and this is not one of those like, look at me celebrating my ignorance kind of things that people do online for some reason, but I suck at maths still. It's something that I want to fix. I just haven't put the time into it yet. So I'm not saying like, oh yeah, I suck at maths and isn't that so virtuous somehow. What I'm saying is despite that, I can still program games, 2D and 3D. Now, how can I do that? How can I have implemented uh, a couple of physics engines, uh, limited physics engines? You know, one of them was one of those soft body ones where everything kind of bounces around like jelly. It's really cool. And how I did that was just in time learning. It's like just in time compilation. You're like, okay, I need to know how to do X in order to achieve Y. I'm just going to learn how to do X. And then you need to do something else. It's a new X, right? So you just look up that thing. You know, that's how I learned everything so far. It's worked really well. There are a lot of gaps in my knowledge, of course. When you learn this way, you don't have all the fundamentals, but that's just kind of the trade-off that you gotta make. Well, you don't have to make it, but that's the trade-off that I made. Now, I wanna go back and learn more of the fundamentals, but that's kind of something that I feel you wanna do as you become more 
intermediate or even advanced is you start to value the fundamentals a lot more. Whereas when you're a beginner, you just want to see stuff happening, right? You don't care about that. So that's also the reason why I prefer intuitive mathematics. Now, what do I mean by intuitive mathematics? Um, well, there's a couple of popular ways to do, for example, uh, rectangle versus rectangle collision detection. You know, these things are moving across the screen. You know, next frame, uh, this one's going to be over here and this one's going to be over here or something and they're colliding. But how do you tell? Well, there's a couple of ways. Um, and I'll just tell you about two of the most common ones. I'm not going to go into depth, but one of them is called a slab test. And the other one is called a uh, Minkowski difference test. And I prefer the Minkowski difference one because basically what you do is you say, okay, if there's two rectangles, right? And then you shrink one of them down to a point and you add the size to the other one. The other one becomes as big as those two added together. And then you just draw a line from the point to where it was going to go. And then you see if that line hits the other box. That's really intuitive. You can just, you can visualize it. You can see, okay, this thing's shrinking, this thing's growing. And now it's like just a, just a segment, a line segment. I don't know. To me, that was just way easier to understand than the slab test. So if you can, and if you suck at maths like I do, you just haven't put the time into it yet, then try to find the intuitive versions of things that, will, that are intuitive to you. And that's intuitive to me. Maybe um, the other way is intuitive to you, the slab test way. Um, all right, so that's mathematics, uh, linear algebra, basically. Just learn that. There's other maths that's good, calculus and uh, exponentials and things, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that stuff. So linear algebra, I think, is the most important. All right, next thing. Uh, memory allocators, or just memory. How does memory work? Uh, a little bit about CPUs, CPU caching. It's not that hard. And also m memory lifetimes. So this matters whether you use garbage collection or not. Whether you use C Sharp or C or C++ or Java, it doesn't matter. If you don't understand any of this stuff, then you can't really make informed decisions about how to use your data, right? Your whole game state lives in memory. All of your entities live in memory. Every time you make a physics calculation, the result lives in memory somewhere. Could be on a stack, could be on the heap, doesn't matter. It's still in the mem memory, right? The point is, if you don't know what you don't know, then you can't really plan. So, for example, um, I, I usually like to use two allocators. One is a permanent allocator and one is a frame allocator. Actually, first I should say, what is an allocator, if you don't know? If you use C and you use the function malloc to get some memory from the heap, that's an allocator. And if you've used, uh, let's say, C sharp, and you use the new keyword, that's allocating memory. That's, I don't actually know what happens in the background in C sharp, but that is using a memory allocator of some kind. So it's just a way to get memory from the computer. All right, so the two allocators I use. I use a permanent allocator, and this one is for everything in the game that is gonna live for the whole time period that the game is open. So this could be things like your settings, you know, you load settings from a file, you have to put them into a data structure somewhere or a struct, not a data structure. Um, you know, you've got to put them somewhere because they do stuff and you've got to read them. So you stick them in the permanent allocator. Uh, you could load, I always put my entities in the permanent allocator, right? And then when an entity dies, I just mark it as dead. And then I just reuse that spot later. Yeah, so that's really like most of my stuff goes in the permanent allocator unless I know I'm going to throw it away really quick. And that gets me to the second one, right? And the second one is a frame allocator. This is just for games and it's just for games that are frame based. Like sometimes you split the frame rate and the physics update or the networking update or something into different loops and they have it at different times. And then your memory allocation gets a little bit more complicated. But for simple games that I'm working on, it's just frame based, right? So at the end of every frame, this memory chunk is just set back to the beginning. So you like allocate these things in blocks. Let's say for example, your physics results, you know, you've done some physics calculations, you need to return a list of something, you know, some things that we hit to somewhere, right? That's gotta be in memory. And then, you know, you allocate the things. And then at the end of the frame, after you've decided what you're gonna do with that stuff that's been hit, for example, things move around or they slide, you know, up and down or whatever, then you just, set that back to zero and the memory's wiped. Now it may seem expensive, but um, as I was just kind of saying, but it didn't really go into it. Uh, it's actually much cheaper than garbage collection. There's no keeping track of which things are being used by other objects and whatever. That's, that's all gone because you know, at the end of every frame, 
all that happens is some structure somewhere that has a, a value of how far into memory this allocator is allocated just gets set to zero, right? So all that memory is now available. It's just one field getting set to zero. That's much cheaper, actually. All right, now the last thing I wanna talk about is a debugger. So I've been programming a bunch of web stuff recently in Go, and Go is garbage collected, and um, it's a web language, so I was writing web services. And maybe my workflow is just not great, um, but I don't really know how to use a debugger with Go and web services because I'm like sending and receiving HTTP requests and what if I break in the middle of trying to receive something? Anyway, so my workflow for web stuff is always print debugging, which sucks, but that's just what I do. <clears throat> so anyway, I went back into Odin, uh, which is the language I'm using for games now, and I was working on the Pong course, uh, link in the description, by the way. And the Pong course uses Odin and Raylib for... Uh, really for rendering, right? And so I, I came across some issue and I was like printing out stuff. I can't remember exactly what the issue was, but it doesn't really matter. I was just printing stuff out to the terminal and like trying to read it and like, what is going on here? And like, maybe I need to print something out at this stage and this stage. And you, you know what happens? You start printing out like zero and then variable name and like, just it just gets crazy, right? So I couldn't figure this thing out. And then I was, I was like, hang on a second. I'm making a game. And one of my rules was I always run my game in the debugger. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> so I open up my debugger and I run the program and then I forgot to set a breakpoint, all right? So then I set a breakpoint and I run it again. And then I step through the code and in like five seconds, I figured out the problem. I can't remember what it was, but I just remember having the realization like, oh, why was I not running this in the debugger? Like, I keep telling myself, you know, always run the debugger. And I used to before I did a bunch of web stuff recently. So always use a debugger. All right, so I recommend either the Remedy BG debugger by George Menhorn. That one's paid though. Um, or the recently released RAD debugger by Ryan Flurry. They're both really good. Um, or you can just use the Visual Studio one, which is from what I can tell really crap. Um, but you know, some people like it for some reason. All right, just a little bit of a channel update for those of you who care. So I've been working on a uh, free Pong course. Actually, it's already finished. Uh, you can find it at programvideogames.com. And these days I'm using Odin and Raylib because I think they're really good. Um, they're just really good technologies that make game programming much more enjoyable. So definitely check those out if you haven't and check out the course. I'm working on a paid course. I'm trying to get feedback and getting feedback from people who have already finished the free course is kind of like getting blood from a stone. Um, and that's fine. That's exactly what I expected. And, it's, you know, I don't blame anyone for not wanting to take a survey. <laughs> no one likes taking surveys. Um, so I'm just currently trying to, you know, DM some people and figure out what exactly they want to learn next and what I can help them with. So if you have any ideas about that, uh, leave some comments below and I will read them. Um, uh, on reading comments in the past, I've been really, let's say, liberal about reading comments. Um, I would just kind of avoid them after I got too many comments because it was just kind of overwhelming. And I know that's kind of crap. Um, so from now on, I'm making an effort to try to read and respond to every comment if possible. It's uh, something that I struggle with. Like even on, um, on Twitter, if I get too many notifications, I just kind of skip reading them. It's, it's a bit weird, um, you, you know, because I want to help people. I want to give people as much as I can. Um, but yeah, I don't know, it gets a bit overwhelming. Anyway, whatever, that's rambling. So this, uh, this video is going on way too long now, so I gotta stop. Uh, I will be back soon with more content. Gonna be more uh, talking head stuff. Got a bunch of videos planned. And for those of you who are wondering when the C Game Engine series is gonna be finished, I'm gonna finish it. Um, the reason I avoided finishing it is because when I went back to it, I really didn't like my style, like my coding style from, from earlier. Um, and it kind of made me cringe. And then I didn't really want to keep using the same style because I found it cringe. But you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how I feel. <laughs> uh, it just kind of matters that I do what I said I was going to do. So I will finish that for you guys. Anyway, catch you in the next one. Thank you and have a good day.